I know you have a choice of multiple sessions. I'm glad you chose mine. Um, uh, my name is Arun Gupta. I work for Amazon. I'm a principal open source technologist. I'm also the CNCF, uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation board member representative. So anything typically around a CNCF is where I get involved from the strategy perspective. I work with a lot of service teams across Amazon in helping define our open source strategy. So if you guys are interested in talking anything around open source, containers, serverless, developer tools, or in general about AWS or Amazon, I'm always happy to talk. And um, we are a customer obsessed company. So how many of you are Amazon.com customer? Yeah, about 80% of you. So thank you for being a customer. We'd love to hear you know, how we're doing. Amazon machine learning is very much at the center of you know, what is happening today in the industry. But what people don't realize is this has been happening for the last 50 years. It has been a key part of how digital transformation or digital innovation has been happening. If you think from the Amazon's perspective, we have been doing machine learning for over 20 years. If you go to Amazon.com website, the moment you say, hey, you like this product, so you may like this product as well, that is driven by machine learning in the back end. If you're saying, Alexa, tell me the Warrior score, that is powered by natural language understanding. Uh, Warriors is a basketball team back in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's my hometown. That's our favorite team, and we are leading 3-2. We're going to just win one more game, and we're done then to the conference finals. <laughs> um, so when I say warriors tell me the score, that is natural language understanding that is powered by machine learning in the back end. Somebody is constantly updating the skill at the back end, and then the whole aspect that is able to understand different accents and the way we are able to launch Echo all around the world is all powered by machine learning. Um, pick, pa pick passes, you know, when you are ordering a packet in the Amazon warehouse, how the robots are moving around to find an optimal path to pick your product, put it on the robot, and bring it out to the front so that it can be shipped. That's all powered by machine learning. IDC says that in 2019, 40% of digital transformation initiatives are going to be driven by machine learning. Things like intelligent customer bots, you know, how you can use services to listen to a customer, you know, take meetings out of it, or do sentiment analysis, provide a better customer reaction, improving customer satisfaction. This is what Subway has done, you know, so things like that are what, what's going to drive. You're no longer looking about reactive healthcare. You're thinking about proactive or a predictive healthcare that, hey, you know what, we think, you know, you're heading on this path based upon the symptoms and all the data that we have available. Let's be more predictive about it. And you know, how uh, in retail industry, the landscape is changing. Uh, the amount of dollars that are going to be spent on machine learning is going to be crazy over the number of years. IDC runs a hype curve that every year, which of the technologies are the peak of the hype curve. And guess what technology has been at the peak of the hype curve for four years? Machine learning. But where we are right now is at a tipping point where more and more industries are adapting machine learning. Now, this session is about, you know, it's, I'm a hardcore developer at heart. I need to hold the technology by the gut. So it's going to be a very developer-focused session on how Amazon thinks about machine learning. More importantly, <clears throat> how do we see our customers running machine learning on Kubernetes? That's, that's what this exact session is about. So our mission at AWS is very simply, you know, we always believe in doing innovation that help others innovate. And so the way we have commoditized data centers using AWS, we have done, you know, fulfilled by Amazon, Amazon Kindle Publishing, all of these is something that we have been doing internally and we have given out to our customers to innovate. And that's sort of what our goal is, that it should not be just for expert data scientists or machine learning developers only. We want to commoditize it so that anybody and everybody, it should not just be restricted to enterprise niche audiences. You know, anybody who is starting, running a startup should be able to adapt these algorithms. So what is the machine learning 101? Um, I'm, I've been working, this is DevOps UK, I've been working with the DevOps for Kids, we're building a brand new DevOps for Kids uh, machine learning workshop for kids. So uh, think about riding a bike. You know, how do you ride, how do you learn riding a bike? You know, your parents teach you, or your friends teach you, or somebody tells you that okay, right, you, know, you want to take a right turn, turn right, you want to take a left turn, turn a left, and your brain tunes up to it. 
as a human, you tend to remember that. You built a mental model of it. And then you turn, okay, hey, I'm going on a straight, straight roads, slopes, turns, curves, bumps. All of those are sort of your training data by which you're getting trained. And then eventually, when you're out on the road, when you're riding it, then that's what your inference is. Okay, so that's when you are into production, so to say, that you're riding a bike. So think of it from a very simple layman perspective. That's how we're going to explain to kids. Hopefully, they'll get it. Because by the time they get to the DevOps for Kids workshop, we expect they're trying to learn machine learning. Hopefully, they've done how to ride bike first. So what's machine learning 101? Machine learning 101 is you have some training data, pictures, you know, simple example, dogs, cats, beer, whatever, and all sorts of pictures. You feed it to a training algorithm. I know it's a Python script, JavaScript, whatever comes to your mind. Um, and then doing multiple training, you get a model out of it, which says, okay, if you tell me a picture, I'll tell you what kind of picture it is. And is it a male? Is it a female? Smiling, frowning, happy, sad, all different kind of expressions. Once you have the training data, then you give you the test data. That, okay, training data is separate, test data is separate. Let's test how my model works. And then you keep running that training until your accuracy and optimization goes high. And you're typically looking at about 90% accuracy, and optimization means how fast your training is run. So you keep altering uh, algorithms or hyperparameter optimizations. I won't dig into the details of those. Once your model is ready, then you actually do inference. That, okay, now my model is ready, I wanna do inference, and I wanna see how this thing is gonna look like. End of the day, from the inference, when this is deployed in production, you give it input data. This could come from anywhere. So that's, the, that's what defines you know, how wide your training and test data is. But you give input data and you do predictions. Bottom line, how good are your predictions? So this is sort of your machine learning 101. So you can really easily, hopefully, correlate how does it correlate to you know, riding a bike, basically, for anybody in that sense? So this is how I understood you know, my basic machine learning 101. Now, when we talk to customers, there's a beautiful song by Elvis Presley and um, Andy Jesse, our CEO, quoted this at reInvent. Our customers tell us a little less conversation, a little more action. You know, yes, there is a little bit of action here and there, but what customers want is commoditize machine learning for me. Make it easy for me to use machine learning, I understand the conversation, but show me real action, which I can turn into something more real, more valuable, more directly applicable to my business. Let's take a look at how Amazon machine learning stack looks like. You know, we look at machine learning at three different layers. Um, at the bottom layer is meant for expert machine learning developers. These are the developers who understand the crux and the core of machine learning. Hey, I'm going to use a framework, TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, pick a framework of your choice. And I'm going to set up my own GPU-based cluster. You know, P2, P3s are the clusters that gives you GPU. To get into why GPU is required. I'm going to use Elastic Inference you know, for my VPC um, EI networking. So, but this is meant for really expert machine learning developers. There are data scientists who love to do this, set it up, play with it. That works for them. Second layer is where we commoditize it, where we offer it as a service in a very classical AWS way. We say, hey, you know what? Hey, you want to do this, all this. You don't want to do all this undifferentiated heavy lifting. We've got Amazon SageMaker. You bring your training data. We'll provide a lot of services around on how we clean up that data, label that data. And then we provide, we host the training, we manage the training, we host the inference, all of that for you, fully managed by Amazon. Intuit is a classic example. Intuit is using Amazon SageMaker. Uh, using SageMaker, they run ML models. Intuit is a, a financial company based out of US. Uh, TurboTax is an extremely popular product. Tax Day, 50, April 15th, goes extremely crazy. So they use uh, Amazon SageMaker, by which they're able to find up to $4,300, uh, a product called Expense Finder, which helps you find that much expenses, about that expenses, for your business deductions for tax purposes. And they use machine learning models using SageMaker. And then at the very top layer is what we have AI services. And the reason we call them as AI services in terms of artificial intelligence is because this is what has a better human cognition to it. Uh, I can give it an image, and using recognition, it can say, oh, male, female, smile, no smile, expressions, whatever it is. Um, I can give it, um, say, translate. 
and it'll translate from one language to another one. I can give it comprehend. It'll do sentiment and intent analysis for me. This is where customers like Subway, they're using Amazon Connect, which is a contact center in the cloud. And for up to 40,000 locations around the world, they're running a contact center, but then they're using tools like these to make it intelligent bot conversations and those interesting experiments. More importantly, their customer satisfaction store is much higher by using a combination of these services. So this is our overall uh, machine learning stack. So you've seen see, uh, layer one, layer two, layer three. And we believe that this is sort of one of the broadest and the deepest ML stack essentially here. But again, a little less conversation, a little more action. It's not just about the machine learning components. One of the surprises to us is when customers talk about machine learning, they forget that, hey, you need storage, analytics, all of those capabilities in it. You, know, you need abilities to run, to store petabytes, terabytes of data. You, know, you want that sub-second latency. You want that you know, uh, ability to execute at a high scale. You want the ability where data can be stored at a huge amount of speed and real-time analytics where queries can be written very easily. And again, in that sense, we have a really huge portfolio from the AWS perspective. So this is exactly what our customers are using in all sorts of ways. And I recommend you to go to awsamazon.com slash machine learning and learn lots and lots of customer stories which are using this in all in amazing ways. Where does Kubernetes fit into this? So if you look at the broader stack here, at the Kubernetes fits at the bottom layer here, essentially. Um, so essentially, when we talk in terms of Kubernetes, you, know, you can take Kubernetes as a base layer. Kubernetes has support for GPU. So for example, you can run Kubernetes on P2, P3 instances. So you can say it's enabled to run on GPU. So you can configure Amazon EKS cluster, which I'll talk about in a second. But you can run that on a GPU. And then all of these frameworks, so TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, Gluon, Keras, they can all run on top of Kubernetes. So essentially, from our talk perspective, uh, we're going to be focusing on this aspect of it. So how do we do machine learning using Kubernetes? I like to set the context. And then now, this is what our focus is going to be. So I'm going to show you how do you spin up a Kubernetes cluster using GPU, why GPU is required. And then I will show you live example of training and inference using TensorFlow and MXNet using Keras. So you'll see live examples, code, and all that stuff, OK? First of all, why machine learning on Kubernetes? The very usual example on why customers like Kubernetes, they love the API. They love the portability it provides, that this is a very simple API. From a organization perspective, they're bought into the Kubernetes dream, that Kubernetes is going to be us. Our applications are going to run on top of Kubernetes. They, they fundamentally have agreed to that part of it because it allows that composability. You know, I can uh, create services. I can ignore the underlying hardware. That's the abstraction layer I really like. It gives them the portability. Same thing on desktop, same thing on-prem, and tomorrow on the cloud, any cloud for that sake. Kubernetes is the base layer that they've agreed to. And the infinite scalability quote unquote, infinite scalability that it gives. Because once you have agreed upon the base layer, you can scale your application across your Kubernetes cluster. You still have to scale your cluster, but then once you have Kubernetes running on top of it, you can really scale your application like crazy over there. So in terms of, uh, if you look at Kubernetes, where it runs on the cloud, according to the latest CNCF survey, over 50% of Kubernetes runs on AWS. Um, thanks to the wonderful work that the community has done before we came on board. And now, of course, we have Amazon EKS. Amazon EKS is the fastest growing compute service for AWS. The, we are getting lots and lots of customers super excited about it. Um, and we just love that uh, entire excitement. But what does EKS give you? EKS gives you, I mean, if you think in terms of Kubernetes, it gives you a control plane and a data plane. Data plane is where your containers are running. Those are the EC2 instances and a control plane which is what you interact with using Kube Control CLI. EKS gives you a managed Kubernetes control plane, and you bring your data plane. There are tools that really simplifies it for you. The most important part of EKS is you know, it's 100% upstream compatible. So the same Kubernetes that you use on your desktop or on your on-prem, that's the exact Kubernetes experience you get 
on ECAS. So the portability, the composability that you're used to, the tools that you're used to, they just work exactly. It's a CNCF certified, and that's what gives you that 100% upstream compatibility. Just like any other AWS service, this is a platform for enterprises to run production-grade workloads. So all the illities, scalability, high availability, reliability that you expect from AWS service is all there as part of ECAS. That is, you don't have to worry about how, how should I set up my control plane? How many etcd servers? Am I using the right instances? Is it secured? Is it backed up? What if I were to scale up? You know, all those things are taken away from you completely because running a Kubernetes cluster is not for the faint of the heart. You know, we manage it for you. You are the best at building your applications and leveraging your core competency rather than doing that undifferentiated heavy lifting. And of course, it provides integration with additional AWS services, but that is completely optional. Uh, for security, we, of course, use IAM, but any other integration that you want to use, you don't have to use, but the integration is there. Okay? So that's sort of the key capabilities for Amazon EKS. Now, a broad, quick architecture. Of course, you all have the control plane running in the cloud. You have your data plane running you know, in the cloud as well. That's done across multiple availability zones over there, just to get a high availability architecture. You have your kube control CLI, which directly talks to the control plane, which then deploys and manages your no pods or services or whatever it is in the, control, in the, in the data plane. Okay? So that's a very simple, very traditional Kubernetes architecture here. How do you get started with Amazon EKS? Uh, there are long documents as well. My personal favorite is EKS control. I just love that CLI. Uh, and that's one of the beauty of Amazon is, you know, I mean, yeah, we have a lot of uh, tools, documentation, but the partner ecosystem really thrives well. This particular one is done by Weaveworks, and this is our documents, our, our docs are actually getting updated where EKS control is going to be a standard CLI that is going to be promoted from our docs itself. So pretty much all of our customers very consistently use EKS control. One CLI, and it re creates all the resources that are needed for you. Okay, um, so if you see what does the command look like, very simple. You know, you brew install um, the EKS control, and literally the con command is EKS control cluster. That's it. It takes a default name, default region, default node type, default number of nodes, um, dedicated VPC, all sorts of stuff. Lots of defaults over there, and each one is configurable. But the idea is EKS control cluster. One command creates a cluster for you. Data plane, control plane, all of that. And then you can talk to it using kube control directly. You want to create a GPU-powered cluster. We'll talk about GPU. Why, why GPU? All you say is EKS control cluster, node type, p 2 extra large, And there you go. You got an extra large cluster. Um, last week, uh, last month, actually, April, yeah, I was playing with a lot of uh, GPU-powered cluster. My EC2 bill came out to be about $15,000. But that's all right, and I was playing for work. But that's just the EC2 bill. I'm not even talking about other storage services. But that's normal. So warning, if you're playing with this thing, make sure to shut it down. Because these instances are expensive. And that's only for a month I got about a, about a $15,000 bill. I haven't been red flagged yet, but should be OK. And this is for work. Um, common question. Why do we need GPUs? You know, why, why is CPU not enough? I mean, that, that's the question that came to my mind. End of the day, when you're doing machine learning, whatever you're doing, it actually is translated as a matrix. Um, so there's a matrix A and there's a matrix B. You know, and as you are trying to figure out, build those training models, what you're doing is you're doing these matrix multiplications. So in this case, for example, I'm multiplying row one with column one, and I get this result in R1, C1. And th this needs extremely high memory bandwidth. And a lot of these calculations are happening behind the scene. So what you really need is you want to parallelize this across thousands of cores. If you look at, say, I7, OK? If you look at I7, uh, that has 125 gigaflops. If you look at a typical P2 instance, that has about 125 teraflops. So we're talking about a thousand time difference right there itself. So a uh, uh, hundred time difference actually. So if you look at the difference over there on how many more GPUs you have as opposed to in a CPU, you can really run, build your training model over there. So what we have seen is typically training 
is heavily done on GPUs because training is time intensive, compute intensive, memory intensive, and a typical GPU can have up to, um, a typical P2 instance can have to four GPUs and a 92 me uh, gigabyte memory. That's a pretty decent size for building a simple small model, essentially. So how do customers set up their Kubernetes cluster for machine learning, okay? Now, first is you set up a cluster let's say Amazon EKS cluster in this case. And by the way, because EKS is upstream compatible, you can take this strategy and apply to any Kubernetes cluster as long as they are Kubernetes compatible as well. So you set up an Amazon EKS cluster in this case. I'm using P3 instances, uh, three P3 instances, and set up in an autoscaling group, okay? We'll talk about what kind of autoscaler you wanna use over here. It's very critical to think about that. Then you have another cluster for inference. Now, in this case, I don't need a chip as powerful as P3. I'm going to use a P2-based instances. You know, the number of GPUs and amount of memory is a bit different between the two. And I can just talk about an hour on why P2, why P3, and that sort of stuff, but that's not the essence here. I would recommend taking a look at the, compare the capabilities of them. So now, go back to our machine learning 101. I have my data. My data is fed into the training cluster. That's where my training job is running. So potentially what you have done is you have your Python script packaged as a, a Docker container that, and then packaged as a pod and then deployed in your training and the training sucks up the data and it runs the model. You do your training optimization, all of that. End of the day, you get a trained model which is sitting somewhere in an S3 bucket. Okay, that's your step two. Now you feed that trained model to your inference code. And that same thing again, your Python script, package as a Docker container, package as a service, running over here. And then, once the inference is running, the user makes a request, and then he says, okay, you built a model, here you go, here's the image, tell me what kind of image it is. And that's your flow, basically. Now in this case, your training is running separately, your inference is running separately, two separate clusters, two separate monitoring, uh, your app could be running somewhere else. So essentially you have multiple clusters running over here, different customers have different requirements, but this is one of the patterns that we have seen among our customers on how they're doing it. This is a dedicated Kubernetes cluster for training and inference, but any collaboration that needs to happen has to be explicitly done in terms of you know, talking to each of the clusters. How do, you, how do you get started with this? Um, EKS control, create cluster, give it a name, um, give it the number of nodes, and give it the number of node types. In this case, it's P38XL. And then similarly, you create an inference cluster. Very straightforward, okay? So this is a simple uh, EKS control commands. Creates two clusters, expensive clusters, so make sure you shut it down. Again, warning, you don't want to get a $15,000 bill. Now, let's talk about scaling the cluster. So scaling the cluster is important. If you look at, by default, and what not default, well, if you have Kubernetes, in Kubernetes you can set up something called as autoscaler. Autoscaler will look at your workload in the cluster, and it will autoscale the cluster, okay? That has to be installed as a separate component. On the other hand, there's a component called as escalator that was contributed by Atlassian, and that is targeted for batch-based workloads. Now, cluster autoscaler is very good for burstable workloads, where it assumes that this is all, boom, the request is going to go up, and then it's going to scale down. Um, and it assumes stateless workloads. And so it actively works towards rescheduling pods to have a cluster efficiency that you may not need the node, I'll shut the node down accordingly. That may not be very appropriate, particularly for an ML workload, because in an ML workload, if your ML job is running, it could take a few hours, maybe a days, you don't want it to aggressively terminate the pod for a cluster efficiency at that point. You want your ML model to be ready. So that's sort of the main difference between the two here. So as I was saying, uh, cluster autoscaler aggressively move pods for utilization for a lower cluster bill, but here in escalator, which is again autoscaler, but it wait for the jobs to be completed because once your training job is running, you wanna make sure, you know, if it's been run for like eight hours, you want the job to complete and then talk about it. Um, Cluster autoscaler scale based upon metrics. You know, hey, you know, your cluster is 80% CPU, scale up. Or cluster is 20% CPU, scale down. Those are the kind of metrics. Here, it aggressively scale up to reduce wait time for the parts because you don't want you know, your cluster to have less capacity, but you want your ML workloads to be finished rather quickly. 
And then there are uh, some um, commonalities as well. So it takes over the desired instance knob for auto scaling group on how it needs to auto scale. And you can run them in the same cluster with different node groups. So the way we saw that is in the previous, the dedicated Kubernetes cluster option, we have two separate clusters, two separate node groups, but you can have a cluster with two node groups as well. So that's my setup Kubernetes for ML option 2A. In this case, I have one EKS cluster. In an EKS cluster, I have two node groups. And the way I'm identifying those two node groups is I'm attaching labels to each of my nodes. So one is role, I mean, role is a random, role colon train is my own custom uh, label. And similarly, role colon inference is my custom label. But essentially, with these two node groups, I have attached labels. And now, my workload is pretty much the same. Now, when I'm targeting a job, how am I targeting a job? Well, in your manifest, you explicitly call out the node selector. That when you are applying this job, use this label. So it's going to go take a this look at this node, and it will apply to the P3 node group here. And in the other case, if you're applying an inference one, then it will apply to the inference node group. The advantage of this is training and inference is happening in the same cluster. So you can just keep talking to each other in the same cluster. You also get a unified monitoring in this cluster. That how is the training job doing? One single dashboard, so consolidated monitoring. Again, different use cases, different customers. So see what's in your need. So this is a unified Kubernetes cluster. How do you create this? Um, instead of giving explicit EKS control command, you can use an EKS control configuration file here. So in this case, I'm just saying cluster config. I got two node groups, ng train, ng inference. I specify labels, instance type, and desired capacity. And then I just say EKS control, take this con configured file, and create my clusters. Okay, So very simple, very straightforward in this case. I mean, you can do that for a single node group as well. But with two node groups, it's all the more easier. Let's look at option 2B. Now, I'm not just running training and inference. I could potentially run my applications here as well. So now I have a new node group here. Now, these two could be my escalator. This and this is escalator. This could be cluster autoscaler. So you can have different autoscaler targeted to different node groups. Now you have one cluster where the training, inference, and the applications are running all together. They're feeding into each other constantly. Within the same cluster you're talking, you're getting a unified monitoring. So it really depends upon what your use case is and what you want to accomplish out of it. And once again, you know, you will, you're, when you're applying the job, you specifically target a node group. So setting up clusters is good. You, know, you, you set up your Kubernetes cluster. That is good to go. Now, you want to set up a, a container. You want to build a container. Uh, you have a Python code. You can get started with the Python code, but what next? Um, uh, uh, I want to make sure my container is optimized. Am I using TensorFlow? Am I using Keras? How should my, what version of TensorFlow should I use? What version of Terra, Keras should I use? How should they be, uh, are there any version mismatches between the two? Uh, how, what should my hyper parameters look like? How should I optimize my containers? Um, it can take days to test and configure. You know, and if a new version comes in, then the whole cycle starts all over again. What's the value in that? And these versions, these containers could be big. Now, I mean, I've seen TensorFlow containers that get up to 1.5 gigabyte, and it's because they're all GPU tuned and all those. So these containers could be really big. So do you want to manage it? Is that sort of, your core, sort of your core competency? And then you need to make sure that the same container would work on your desktop, in the cloud, on premise. You know, is that sort of your core competency once upon it? So I think that's the point you need to think about it. So this is a common challenge that we have seen. Our, our customers have told us that they don't find it a very easy solution to it. So based, keeping that into mind, we introduce uh, AWS deep learning containers. Um, and these deep learning containers are basically prepackaged Docker container images, uh, fully configured and validated and supported by AWS. Uh, lots of different combinations available over here. They are meant for scalability and performance tuned for AWS. Uh, they are available on uh, Elastic Container Registry but by no means restricted for AWS. You can use them anywhere you like, but of course they are well-tuned for AWS. So uh, we have tested them as e ECS, EKS, and EC2. And things like, you know, um, there are frameworks like Horoward by Uber, um, 
we'll talk about it later when we use TensorFlow for training. TensorFlow training, a lot of customers do single node training. But at scale of Uber, and I was at a Uber Science Symposium Summit last week, the scale that they have, single node training doesn't work for them. You know, because they have millions of vehicles with millions of drivers and millions of humans interacting over there. So the kind of machine learning data they have, they build frameworks like Horoboard and um, Michelangelo and all, which really allows them to scale, to do multi-node training. And that's where you know, all of this is baked into the image for you, all pre-configured. Otherwise, setting them up could be a big challenge. Oh, what? Why is it saying low battery? OK, I connected. So these are basically 16 container images, uh, a mix of TensorFlow and MXNet, mix of different Python versions, GPU, CPU, training, and inference. So all different combinations are available. So these 16 images are available for you out of the box. You, know, you can um, search for AWS deep learning containers, and it'll tell you what the different containers are. And we'll, we'll be, um, we, you can download these containers and run them. Now let's take a look at it. So we understand the containers part of it. Now I want to run my machine learning workloads on Kubernetes. So if you start building your algorithm and you start configuring your Kubernetes for running machine learning workloads, you need to think about where am I going to store my machine learning data? What my framework is going to be? Is TensorFlow optimized for desktop, on-premise, on-cloud? what my tooling is going to look like. You know, can I, am I, I'm a Java developer. Can I do everything from IntelliJ? Or do I have to use Maven? Or do I have to use completely learn a brand new language to get that going? You know, is the model tuned for my current compute environment? And then when you start moving to the cloud, it's a completely different set of tool chain that you have to think about. May not be completely different, but I mean, still quite a bit different. So that's a common problem. When I, when I, so Kubernetes is a basic layer that you have agreed, agreed upon. But once you're trying to put ML on top of it, it's a very new, different set of tool set that you need to get used to. What Kubeflow gives you is Kubeflow gives you a consistent flow on top of Kubernetes. It says it's basically installed as a CRD on top of Kubernetes. It says, here is a consistent programming environment for running your ML workloads on top of Kubernetes, okay? So what we're gonna be using, you know, a lot of our customers, actually most of our customers, when they're running ML workloads on EKS, they're actually using Kubeflow. So um, most of my examples when I'm using TensorFlow are gonna be using Kubeflow here. So what's in Kubeflow? Um, Kubeflow has, uh, the main thing that you wanna think about is there is a TensorFlow serving and training controller. So that really allows you to build your TensorFlow models and de deploy them. Uh, it also comes with Jupyter Notebook, which is very useful for collaborative editing, particularly from data scientist perspective. They can write their Python code and say, go execute this, and then give me the results back. And then eventually, that notebook can say, you know what, OK, that is going to be packaged as a Docker container that's going to run into production. Um, there are other things as well, uh, framework operators, like MXNet operator is there, Argo is there, uh, Ambassador Reverse Proxy is there, a lot of other fun things over there. But those are sort of the primary things that our customers have been using mostly. So what are we going to use for um, our database? Okay? Because what I want to show you is how we run ML workloads on Kubernetes. So we're going to be using MNIST database. MNIST database is a standard database you know, that's used for uh, samples for building machine learning. And if you think about it, this is a database of grayscaled handwritten digits. And you can see sort of how a sample looks like. Um, it's a training set of 60,000, uh, total of 70,000 digits. But 60,000 is exclusively marked for training and 10,000 marked for uh, testing. Um, this one, these are all 28 by 28 pixel images. Their size normalized. And the digits that are written, handwritten, are centered in that 28 by 28 pixel. Now, this is a very, very restricted, very, very hand-structured data that's not real world. If you're thinking about cats and dogs pictures, there can be all kind of pictures over there. You know, um, some chihuahuas might look like a cat. Some monkeys might look like a dog. So you don't know how that's going to look like. So I'm just going to highlight on how much work it takes once you get the data, on how much of cleansing that needs to be done, how much of tagging, how much of labeling that needs to be done. In this case, for example, each image, for example, is tagged and labeled, hey, that this is number seven. 
So when you are building your test data, the, all the tagging has to be done. So if you are interested in something like that, we introduced something called as ground maker truth or a ground truth um, at reInvent last year, uh, which really simplifies your tagging, labeling of all of those jobs. So take a look at ground truth that really simplifies your ML processing over there. But this is sort of what our test data is going to be. We're also going to use fashion MNIST data, which is by Zalando, excellent company based out of Germany, uh, retail uh, fashion company, um, runs um, a lot of their Kubernetes clusters on top of e uh, e AWS. Um, and so fashion MNIST data is basically a database of their online articles that they sell on their website. Um, is exact drop-in replacement of MNIST, but in this case, of course, these are fashion images. Okay? Um, and uh, you can see these are boots and purses and jackets and all sorts of stuff over here. So that's what we're going to be using primarily for our training and inference. All right, so let's get real now. Let's get, let's get to the code. So what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is an open source library built, was built by Google Brain team. Um, it can, uh, you can very easily use it for training and inference your machine learning models. Uh, typically, the Google... Um, sorry, TensorFlow API by itself is a bit complex to use, so customers use it by front ending with Keras. So Keras is an interface that sits on top of TensorFlow, and you generally see TensorFlow and Keras being used right next to each other, and Keras is the API that you will interact with. Um, so what I'm going to show you here is... Um, in terms of, you know, there was a study done in November 2018 which says 85% of TensorFlow runs on AWS. And these are some of the customers that are running TensorFlow on AWS. And this list continues to expand very crazy. Um, now, there is a stock TensorFlow that you can download from the web, you know, from the GitHub repo or whatever, it, wherever it's available. But then we have a customized version of TensorFlow, uh, which is about 90% efficient, as opposed to 65% efficient in terms of the GPUs that you can give. And we don't want to keep these innovations to ourselves, so we, we are working to contribute this upstream. That's one of the fundamental things that we believe in. We have done this tuning. We have done this optimization. Let's give it back to upstream. That's the fundamental change. That's the kind of thing that you know, I, I push for uh, heavily at Amazon. So um, what are we going to do in machine learning using TensorFlow? My last slide before I jump to code. Um, we're going to download a Keras consumable. You know, I mean, the way TensorFlow operates is it consumes the data in a different format. The way Keras consumes is a different format. So what we're going to do is we're going to download a Keras consumable fashion MNIST database. We're going to consume it, and we're going to run the training 40 times. Okay, um, And when we're going to run the training, what we're going to do is we're going to read the training data, build the training model, feed the test data, match the expected output, and say, what is my accuracy? And then I'm going to feed that data back into the training. Well, this yellow box is called as one epoch. And what I'm going to run is I'm going to do 40 epochs of the model, or 40 epochs of the training. And then that gives me a model. And that model is basically exported to an S3 bucket. And then I'm going to run an inference on top of that. So okay, take that model and show me what happens. So let's take a look at the code here. So this is the main repo that you want to think about. So this is where all the work has been done, uh, machine learning using Kubernetes. This is the AWS samples repo. And in this, uh, this is what we are recommending to our customers as well. So it talks about how you can do training and inference using TensorFlow and MXNet on Amazon EKS. Of course, you can use any Kubernetes cluster, as I said earlier. So let's look at it here. The first step, of course, is to create GPU-enabled workers using Kubeflow. So I won't dig into the details over here, but all the instructions are mentioned over here. And by the way, if you go to, say, kubeflow.org slash docs, if you go to slash docs, and then you can say Kubeflow on AWS, and all these instructions are here as well, because that's how most of our customers are doing. And this is the work that was done out of my team um, that we said, hey, we need to push these instructions up there so that it's available right on the main website itself. So I have a Kubernetes cluster up and running on my machine already, well, up, up in the cloud. Um, and what we're going to do is a single node training for Fashion MNIST. So 
Uh, literally, you can copy paste these steps and they should just work out of the box for you. Uh, that's sort of the intent. Uh, show me, give me your aha moment and then I'll worry about the details later. So in this case, it kind of talks about that, hey, if you, you, you want to do training, here's a Docker image that you need to use. And in this case of a Docker image, you know, what, is your, what do you need to configure? Because you're going to be storing the model to S3 bucket. So I need your AWS credentials, essentially. They, they get stored as a secret in Kubernetes cluster. Once you have done that, then I'm going to just say mnistrain.yaml. And um, this is going to use, um, this is going to provision my algorithm and my business logic, which is going to do the training behind the scene. Once you check the progress in training, it says basically that, all right, what I'm doing here is I'm downloading the data from these APIs. This is uh, TensorFlow Keras data sets. Okay? I download the training data. Then I am initializing my secret keys here. And this is where I start running the training. Well, instead of 40 epochs, I'm running 10 epochs here. So I keep doing the training multiple times. And then I'm seeing the test accuracy is about 87%. And then I export the model over here. So what really happened behind the scene is again explained in detail over here. Okay. So this is uh, kind of written down exactly what really happens. You can look at the actual uh, mnist.py code over there on what's really happening behind the scenes, but that's really using TensorFlow and Keras all together, and that's what is running your business logic. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to show you the inference part of it. Okay. Now, let's say you don't want to do training. You just right away want to jump to inference. So what we have done is we have saved a copy of the trained model in the GitHub repo, all you need to do is sync it up to your S3 bucket. And once you sync it up to your S3 bucket, then you're good to go. So I mean, it kind of gives you the steps for that as well. Now, I need to install the TensorFlow serving component in my Kubernetes cluster. Again, I need to have my secret.yaml so that I can read from the S3 bucket where the model is stored. And once I set up all the parameters for TensorFlow, my pod is running. So what I'm going to do here is, well, let's first of all look at this. If I get the context, this is my Arun at Kubeflow AWS context. I, mean, I have other clusters running as well. And this is the current one as well. So this is what it shows. Okay. Now, in this cluster, I can give this command where it says, give me the parts in the Kubeflow namespace. And the selector is app equals to mnist label. So my pod is up and running for 35 hours. So what I can do is I can just do simple port forwarding here. I can just copy paste this command here. Okay. This is going to do a port forward here. So let's open up a new tab. And now I can actually go to samples, mnist, inference, TensorFlow. And this is where my inference client is running. So you can show you my inference client here. This is where I'm using TensorFlow as TF. I'm importing the Keras. We can go down the source code here. This is where, I mean, the code is not that interesting. It's a very standard TensorFlow Keras code. But what I'm going to do is I am going to take it here. And I'm going to run the code. And in this code, what it's going to do is it's going to, I mean, ideally, I should have given it a real image and say, go predict it. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm cheating a little bit. I'm just taking an image from the test data itself, a random image from the test data, and I'm feeding it to the model. Ideally, your test train and real data are completely separate, but there is no correlation. Because that's what the accuracy of the model comes in handy. So I'm going to give the client here, but just for simplicity. I'm going to say, pick an image from the test data. Show me what the image looks like. And it's a 28 by 28 image, so it looks a little blurry here. But if you see here on the back end, it says the model thought this was a code class 4, and it was actually a code class 4. So that, that's what it says. And you know, that's sort of the training that's happening. So what's really happening is when I say Python inference client um, is talking to localhost colon 8500, that's the port forwarding I have done on my machine earlier. 
That's where it goes and talks to the Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes cluster then has the model stored in S3 bucket. It pulls the model, you know, it runs the, runs the inference, returns the results back through the port forwarding, and the result comes back here. Okay, so let's run it once again. It's going to pick a random image again. And it says shirt class 6. So once again, shirt class 6, and it was actually a cl shirt class 6. Okay, so that's a very simple um, TensorFlow. So literally, you can copy paste the command and get going with this, and you can start tweaking it for your own environment. Now, what I can do is I can talk a little bit about MXNet, and I can show you a sample for that as well. So MXNet is an Apache project, um, and Amazon was big mover behind moving it to Apache. Um, so let's go to the next slide here. Um, it provides a very simple, clean API. You know, it runs very well on AWS, and uh, it gives really uh, linear scaling across hundreds of GPUs. That's where our customers are using it, basically. So what I'm going to show next is another example of doing the same training and inference this time with using the MNIST database using uh, MXNext, MXNet. Okay. Hello. Okay. So let me go ahead and cancel the port forward here because we need this port here. So once again, if we go to the single node training for MNIST using MXNet and Keras. You can use a pre-built Docker image, or you can build your own image. Then you create the Docker deployment. Then it starts downloading the data. And then it starts running the training here. And this time, we're running 12 epochs. Keeps going. And what it's generating is basically a MNIST symbol and a params file. And this, you can package using a MXNet model archiver into an archive file. And once you package into an archive file, that's the model that is fed to the inference. And what we have for you convenience, we have the archive file stored in the GitHub repo so that in case you want to get started with it, that's already there. So if I go to the MXNet model server here, you want to run inference on EKS. And we have a pre-built image with the model baked in for you. And all you need to do is create the serving over there. So just the way we did in TensorFlow, let's get the pods here once again. So I'm going to look for it. And it's been running for 35 hours as well. So that's cool. Let's expose the service once again here. OK, it's running in the background. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to curl it. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, um, Here, I'm just actually saying curl to localhost colon 8080. Um, this is where it's going. So from this one, basically, uh, because my service is running, from the service, it gets the item's metadata name. And it's basically port forwarding to the service, which is where my ALB or my ELB is running. So it gets the elastic load balancer name. And it just guides the tra uh, traffic to that particular port over there, or to the host and port. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to curl it. So if I curl it, so I'm saying localhost colon 8080, which is actually going to the ELB running in the cloud. And that's, that's where my MXNet model server is running, So just like TensorFlow serving component. And I'm giving it a test data, which is util9.png, shown over here. So it says prediction is number 9 with probability of 92%. Okay? So what we can do is we can just open this image so that we know what this image is. And it's just not the name. So this is number nine. And so I can, I can go here, and now I can run the same test with 7.jpg, for example. And it says 7 with a probability of 100. So the point I wanted to show you is the training and the inference and all the steps are all there. I probably won't be able to go into the details. I'll, of course, publish the slides here. But there are several advantages of running Kubeflow on Amazon EKS. Uh, my slide shows up. 
So I won't dig into the details for each one of them, and I could take a little long time over here. But the one that I would like to highlight is uh, we have written a brand new CSI driver that really allows you to use Amazon FSx. And that is really something that you need for high-performance computing that allows you to integrate with your FSx file system and leverage that because that is what is required for machine learning uh, workloads. Um, won't dig into the details for Horoboard as well. Now, typically, when customers deploy, they look at the machine learning pipeline. These are the different stages that we have seen them going through, that you need to collect and prepare that data, then you got to tag it, then you got to choose your ML algorithm, then you got to manage your training environments, um, keep running, doing it multiple times, then you have to manage your environment in production, and then scale it. Okay? Let's see how this looks like for Kubernetes side of the world. Um, you can do EMR, Redshift, S3, a wide variety of tools for Kubernetes. Uh, you can bring your algorithm, whatever you like. You can set up your environments, you know, use GPU, CPU-based clusters. Um, in the train and tune model, you can use TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, whatever works for you. Uh, we'll have a PyTorch sample added to the GitHub repo as well, so that you know, in case that is your favorite framework, you can start using that too. Uh, in terms of deploying model in production, you can of course use TensorFlow serving component or MXNet model server or whatever is your favorite tool is. And of course, in terms of scaling and managing, this can all be done on EKS. That's sort of our EKS pipeline that our customers typically use. And then of course, uh, we have Amazon SageMaker where all of this is fully automated for you. So just one click, that's where our customers are really enjoying on how they're building machine learning models. You don't have to manage any of that. All of these capabilities are baked into SageMaker for you. So really, this is sort of the GitHub repo where the content is available for you. So um, if you have, I would love to see any issues, any pull requests. What would you like to see over there? What worked for you? What didn't work for you? We want to keep it in an issue and pull request driven conference. All right, thank you. <laughs>